Tonight, Ontario ramps up enforcement. If you are not willing to comply, then you are breaking the law. The province gives police new powers to enforce the stay-at-home order, what officers now have the authority to do, and why it is not sitting well with some advocates. Plus... We're extending the emergency declaration and prolonging the stay-at-home order for an additional two weeks. The Premier also announcing a host of stricter measures affecting everything from retail to outdoor activities to interprovincial traveling. We'll have all the details and... A real sense of fear, a real sense of logistical collapse. With hospitals filling to capacity and more patients each day landing in the ICU, Ontario is reaching out to other provinces to send help. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. The province extending its stay-at-home order and announcing a host of new restrictions today. We will get to them all very shortly, but first, one change that is drawing a lot of criticism. The government said it will be giving police and bylaw officers new powers to enforce the stay-at-home order. Jessica Ng is live for us tonight at Toronto Police Headquarters. Jessica, what will these officers have the authority to do? Kelda, after midnight tonight, if you're outside of your home, police can stop you. They can ask you to identify yourself, stop vehicles that are on the road, and additionally, they can issue tickets that they feel you're disobeying the rules. Now, police officers don't seem like they might have been expecting these rules. When we spoke to the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police this police this afternoon, they said that they didn't have the full details and they were actually just receiving the technical details of this briefing. And this was several hours after Ford had made his announcement. So there's several details of this police enforcement and what it will look like come tomorrow that are unclear. But one thing is for sure, advocates say that it infringes on civil rights and those hit hardest by the pandemic, it's going to hit them further. We are taking decisive action on the ground to dramatically step up enforcement. Premier Ford announcing the changes that will begin at 12.01 a.m. Saturday, giving police sweeping new powers. It allows police officers to ask the person why they are not at their place of residence and what their place of residence is. If an officer has reasonable grounds to believe a person is in violation of any part of the emergency order, they will be asked to identify themselves and may be issued a ticket and a roughly $750 fine. If you refuse to identify yourself, you could be arrested and charged with a criminal offence. So understand the restrictions will be strongly, strongly enforced because they must be. Just hours before the announcement, Toronto Police tweeted this on knowing your rights about arbitrary ID collection. Meanwhile, OPP officers will be stationed at interprovincial entry points beginning Monday. They will be screening all vehicles coming in from Manitoba and Quebec, and those travelling for non-essential reasons will be denied entry. Michael Bryant is the executive director of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and a former attorney general for Ontario. And we've never seen anything like that in Canada before, and I don't think we should see it in this country. He says his organization may bring forward a charter rights violation. Social justice advocates say the stay-at-home amendments do further damage to communities already hit hard by the pandemic. Police tend to harass uh, Black people, Indigenous people, people who are living in poverty, uh, people with disabilities more than other folks in our society. And so all that I see that this will do is give them further license to do that unhindered. It's this cycle of all of these things coming together that aren't really gonna solve the problem, but are gonna put a whole bunch of lives in danger. I can't believe we've gotten to a place in this pandemic where we're pushing more policing instead of something like paid sick leave, which would actually just help people um, who are just trying to make ends meet. Now, Jessica, we also heard the Solicitor General being asked whether people should report on their neighbours and what was her response to that? 
our response to that was that it is citizens' responsibility to, in fact, report their neighbors, report gatherings. She described it as your responsibility to ICUs, to nurses, and to the health care system. But all of the advocates that I spoke to today said that snitch lines and snitch culture provide opportunities for overt racism and just go to hurt marginalized communities. Those are the ones, again, that are already hurting the hardest, hurting the most from the pandemic, and that's because they often get reported most by those avenues. I'll send it back to you in studio now. Thanks so much for that, Jessica. That was our Jessica Ng reporting live for us tonight. As mentioned, the Ford government also announcing some stricter measures today. This, as Ontario reported, 4,812 new cases of COVID-19 beating yesterday's record. In fact, that is three straight days of new peaks. And the situation inside hospitals remains dire. Nearly 2,000 people are currently hospitalized with the virus, and a record 700 people are in the ICU. Our Chris Glover explains what the new measures are as the province tries to stop the surge. Other than food and pharmacy, this strip of the Danforth is full of closed shops. If they continue to keep us shut down, uh, you know, I'll end up like the rest of the block here where it'll say uh, for lease and for rent and that uh, breaks my heart a little bit, you know, after uh, nine years being in business. Now we know the stay at home order will be extended for two weeks until at least May 20th. We have to do more. The reality is there are a few options left. We have implemented the strictest measures in all of North America. The premier says starting Saturday, all outdoor gatherings will now be strictly limited to members of the same household. All outdoor recreation, including golf courses, soccer fields and playgrounds will be restricted. I know it's been a longer winter, but now our summer is at risk that unless further actions are taken, Case rates will continue to rise, pushing our hospitals to the brink. All non-essential construction will be halted. Essential retail, including big box stores and grocers, will be capped at 25%. Sources say a nightly curfew was debated by cabinet, but ultimately decided against. Today's news comes two weeks into the province-wide shutdown and a week into the stay-at-home order. And still, Ontario is breaking daily case counts and ICU admissions. Having every opportunity to learn from those jurisdictions and our colleagues. No one could ever have predicted that we here in Ontario would be in such dire straits. Vaccine supply is being fast-tracked by 25% to Ontario's hotspots, like this East York neighbourhood with a mobile vaccine clinic today. I'm really excited um, because it, we're going somewhere. The excitement is tempered by the new rules. I feel these restri restrictions should have been long, long time ago. We should have been doing this nine months ago as opposed to right now. Um, and I think it's a bit disappointing, a lot disappointing for a lot of us because we've come so far and it feels like this is the beginning. And another restriction that we are hearing is that starting on Monday, religious services for weddings and funerals will be capped both indoors and outdoors to 10 people. Now, amid all of these restrictions, I just got off the phone with a doctor and he said the frustration for him was what he did not hear today. And that is paid sick leave for essential workers, something that so many people in the medical community have called for for so long. We did not get any new details on new supports for essential workers today. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. The Premier's announcement came following the latest COVID-19 modelling. It shows that cases in Ontario could rise to about 17,000 in two months if stricter measures are not taken. Lorena Redekop takes a look at the numbers. Progress is both frustrating and frightening. The co-chair of the COVID-19 science table showed that new cases are way up in almost all health units in the province, highest in the GTA. That's where test positivity is also highest. He showed the worst case scenario of more than 30,000 cases by the end of May has been avoided by restrictions already added. But without much tighter measures, cases could hit around 17,000. Brown predicted this scenario more than two months ago. Uh, am I missing something here, or is this presentation actually predicting a disaster? No, I, I don't think you're missing anything. Um, this is what we're expecting uh, moving forward. We are moving forward if we uh, relax public health measures. And I don't want to concern, scare people more than you need to, is that it can get a lot worse. ICU admissions are rising sharply and will continue to rise for at least two weeks. 
Uh, we are on track uh, over the next uh, two or three weeks to actually hit almost 1,000 patients in intensive care units. And unless we're able to break that, uh, we could actually see higher and higher levels. It's much more than numbers for Mary Lynn Futers. Her mom, Patricia McRae, is in ICU. Somehow she caught COVID, initially thinking she had vaccine side effects, not the virus. She was so afraid of it. She did everything right, followed public health measures. She got vaccinated. She says both her parents tested positive. Her dad, already vaccinated a month earlier, had no symptoms. Like She's still critical, so I, I'm also fearful of what happens when they get overwhelmed. How does her care change? How are these healthcare workers going to balance all of this? Um, my mom's road, if she's survived this, is long. The recovery is long. She'll never be the same woman ever again. She hopes people pay attention to health officials. In addition to some of the restrictions the province announced today, Brown called for better sick leave for essential workers and making the list of essential businesses as small as possible saying this shouldn't be about public health versus the economy. It's not a trade-off. Every jurisdiction has found itself, as cases rise, having to impose stronger measures. If we want to move forward with uh, as good a summer as we can, uh, the stronger measures we have in place, the longer we have in place for now, means that we don't have to keep on doing this. Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto. Meteorologist Nick Cernkovich joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Nick, rain and gray skies today, a pretty dreary end to the week. Yeah, they were, Calda, but things are changing as we head into the weekend. Uh, we're still seeing some showers as we head through the overnight period tonight, but into Saturday, Sunday, and actually even a Monday as well. Uh, some good hints of sunshine in there and temperatures into the double digits. So a bit of a bright spot in all of this. Here's how it plays out. As we head through uh, the next 24 hours, what we're looking at here is cloud cover slowly starting to break up. Still a cloudy start to the day tomorrow. And then as we head into the afternoon, we will see some sunny breaks in there. You saw that little bit of green that just kind of pushed down. Uh, we're looking at the risk of a few spotty showers tomorrow, but mostly down toward the west end of the Golden Horseshoe. As we head through Sunday, same story, the risk of a few spotty showers, but generally speaking, some good sunny breaks in there and Monday as well. Forecast as we head through tonight and tomorrow, four degrees through the overnight. Again, a few spotty showers tomorrow. Uh, cloud cover, then a mix of sun and cloud, then back to cloud cover again. Winds light, high of 13 degrees. Through the long range forecast, though, things are changing once again. Full details in just a bit. Thanks so much, Nick. One person has died after a shooting in North York tonight. Police were called to Jane Street and Queens Drive north of Lawrence for reports of gunshots at around 645. The male victim was rushed to hospital where he was pronounced dead. Police say multiple people were seen fleeing the area through a ravine. No suspect information has been released. With the province's hospitals filling to capacity and doctors saying they are concerned the system is on the brink of collapse, Ontario is asking the rest of Canada for help, requesting more than 600 health care workers to lend a hand in its hospitals. Angelina King reports. My job is unlike it's ever been in the past 21 years. Dr. Carrie Bernard usually has one job, being a family physician in Brampton. Now she has four, including what she says is the most stressful, but right now the most important, being trained and redeployed to an ICU. We're going to learn what we need to learn to provide the care that everyone in Ontario needs and deserves. But it's serious. I think it's hard. Um, we're stretched. We're tired. And, I, and it's gonna get a little bit worse. And so we're doing everything we can. She says she's afraid there won't be enough staff. So is the provincial government. Ontario has sent letters to the rest of the country asking that more than 600 healthcare professionals be sent here for a four month period, specifically nurses, respiratory therapists and anesthesia assistants. It said it's dealing with a shortfall of more than 4,000 nurses. We are working with the, having some retired nurses being able to come back and dealing with having them requalified so that they can practice as well. And we are also looking at some international jurisdictions as well. The Prime Minister says Ottawa will, quote, do whatever it takes to help. Discussions are ongoing about extra health care providers and we are ready to step up. 
tents are being set up to make more room. Sunnybrook says its field hospital will be ready to accept patients on Monday. It'll be for those who are at the end of their hospital stay recovering from COVID-19. And these tents are set up outside of UHN emergency departments to accommodate the influx of people waiting and allow for more physical distancing. Our waiting room uh, is, is large, but simply not large enough to handle the volumes that we have right now. Dr. O'Connor says space is one thing and that extra staff would be helpful right now, particularly in ICUs. The type of staff that's needed is very highly trained, specialized nursing and, and physician staff um, to be able to manage these patients. And for the staff already working in Ontario hospitals? A real sense of fear, a real sense of logistical collapse and uh, a real sense of what can we wait for next, an impending sense of doom. Dr. David Carr says the biggest fear among frontline staff is the worry they'll have to decide who gets care and who doesn't. And we're terrified and it's hard to imagine that some degree of that triage framework will not become a reality with the projections. We've heard from some provinces about where they stand when it comes to sending health care workers here to Ontario. So far, Saskatchewan, Alberta and Nova Scotia say they're not in a position to do that. Quebec is still deciding. Meanwhile, Newfoundland says it'll be happy to help where there's capacity. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. The mechanisms are completely different. Also, the severity. Are women who take hormonal birth control at a greater risk of blood clots from the COVID-19 vaccine? We ask the experts coming up.
Millions of people have been getting COVID-19 vaccines, including women on hormonal birth control. And there have been questions about whether that has any possible link to rare reports of blood clots. As Lauren Pelly explains, experts say there is no evidence yet of any connection between vaccines and birth control. Most women on hormonal birth control take it knowing there is some risk of blood clots. So the news that some COVID-19 vaccines have been linked to rare clots, mostly in women, has some worried about taking on extra risk. But Canadian experts say we're talking about two very different health issues. With respect to the numbers that we've seen with blood clots and you know the birth control pill, for example, those are not these the same types of clots that we're seeing with the vaccines. The mechanisms are completely different. Also, the severity. Physicians say there are well-known treatments for more common clots, like those tied to being on the pill or being pregnant. Less is known about post-vaccine clots or why exactly they're happening. These are more aggressive and we don't understand them the way that we understand clots in pregnancy or when you're taking a combined hormonal contraceptive. This week, U.S. officials suspended use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after six reports of clots following close to 7 million doses administered. All women, all in their childbearing years. But when asked about possible links to birth control, officials said none of the women were taking it. I think right now it is too early to actually figure out if there was something about these women that predisposed them to having this rare event. With concerns swirling, some Canadian women like 52-year-old Angie Volgerson are stuck in limbo. She had one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine before Canadian recommendations changed to make it 55 plus. My concern is when will I get a second vaccine? Will it be AstraZeneca or will it be something else? But we'll just have to wait, I guess. All Canadians will have to wait for answers with more research needed. But experts do agree the risks of dire outcomes from COVID-19 far outweigh any rare risks from vaccines. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Back to Watanabe, the three, and he drills it, Watanabe. No the Raptors taking on the Orlando Magic tonight. Red, Fred Van Vliet back in the lineup for the first time since April 2nd. A skip ahead to the third quarter. The Raps outscore the Magic 38-19 to take control of the game. Paul Watson scoring 20 of those points and ending the game with a career best 30 points. The Raptors win this one 113-102. Rain and cloud this evening with some foggy patches as we head into the overnight. Currently, it's about six degrees downtown. All right, let's go back to Nick now with a look at the extended forecast. And Nick, I am glad to hear there will be some sunshine this weekend. Yeah, there will, Cal. That you know, as we uh, look back at the last week, it was hard to know whether you had to bring your sweater, your T-shirt, your rain jacket. Uh, you basically needed it all. It was on and off showers. That pattern is starting to break down. So in the headlines, first of which showers ending tonight, sunny periods into the weekend. You probably want to ignore this one. Say it ain't snow. I'm going to explain that in the long range forecast, but. Uh, I'll leave that for, for just a little bit. Let's look at the bright side of all this forecast first here. 10 degrees today uh, as we head through the next couple of days, more in the way of double digits. We've got um, cloud cover starting to break up, uh, showers through the overnight. Tomorrow morning, though, I think we're still going to see cloud cover into the afternoon. We get a mix of sun and cloud, and then through the later part of the day, sort of clouds over again. Risk for a few showers tomorrow, but especially down around the Hamilton, Burlington, St. Catharines area. As we head through Sunday, again, sunshine, a uh, little bit of cloud cover through the afternoon very slight chance we're going to see some isolated showers and Monday more or less the same although I think Monday we see more in the way of uh, sunshine forecast wise for tonight uh, here's what it looks like a minus one down in Windsor because it's going to be clearer sooner a bit more in the way of cloud cover as you head further toward London so temperatures uh, hovering around that one degree mark so right around the zero mark for the most part tomorrow pretty good looking day more in the way of sunshine down in southwestern Ontario 15 degrees in Windsor 13 out toward the London area golden horseshoe a little warmer through the overnight again this because of the cloud cover there are three four degrees across the region as we head through tomorrow we're looking at temperatures by and large 11 12 13 degrees where we're looking at a few showers here is going to be by Hamilton Burlington and St. Catharines and only about a 30 percent chance of seeing that in the Toronto area long-range forecast okay 
Let me explain what I said off the top there. So starting with the weekend, pretty good looking forecast, 13, 12, 13, good deal of sunshine there. Sharp cold front roars through Tuesday into Wednesday, rain showers. Some models though, showing accumulating snows around the GTA Tuesday night into Wednesday. It is too early to say how much, but I think some areas around us may see some accumulating snows. We'll have to wait until next week to get a better handle on what exactly we're looking at with this system, Kelda. Not to scare you, but. Oh, thanks, Nick. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train. Finally tonight, plenty of people have a pet who wakes them up in the morning, but that pet probably doesn't look like this. This is Messi, a puma named after famous soccer player Lionel Messi. His Russian owners, both psychologists, bought him from a petting zoo, and they adapted their home to meet their pet puma's needs, covering some walls with bamboo for Messi to use as scratching posts. They say the puma was in poor health when they got him, and they had to teach him to run and jump. But he seems to be doing pretty good right now. 
And that is our show for you tonight and for the week. Thank you so much for watching and we will leave you with some pictures of the signs of spring outside. Have a great weekend, everyone.